We are continuing our study in the book of Ephesians. It is the epistle of Paul that is written to the Ephesians or the church at Ephesus. We have subtitled it, Salvation, Individual and Corporate. And further subtitled it, The Unity That Believers Have in Christ Brings Unity in the Church, Which is the Body of Christ. This is sermon number 99, and this section of our text in this series has been entitled, Equipping the Saints for the Work of Ministry, Part 4. Our text is Ephesians 4. We are looking at verses 11 through 13. The Apostle Paul writes, And he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Shall we look to the Lord our God in prayer? Our Holy Father, we thank you for the privilege we have to come to examine your holy word. We praise you, O God, that your word is a light to our path, that it directs us in the way that we should go and walk, the things that we should believe and embrace and practice in our life. So, God, we ask in this time as we come to worship and to serve you, as you have revealed your word unto your church, so by thy spirit illuminate our minds to receive and understand that which your spirit has taught, both in writing and in conveying that truth with the heart of those who know you. We thank you and we praise you. We ask, O Holy God, that in all these things you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to receive that which your word and spirit would teach us in this hour, in Christ's name, amen. This last Lord's Day, you remember we continued in verse 11. And we examined the idea thus far of Christ preparing his church for carrying out his ministry by calling and equipping men for office. The first office we examined was the office of the apostle. And then we looked at the second office of authority, which was that of a prophet. The third was an evangelist which we've seen both not only as a calling, but also as a power or act that men were carrying out in the spreading of the gospel. We noted that the closest thing today that we even have to that, though men call themselves the term evangelist, which by that they mean itinerant ministry, same kind of principle that you had and we viewed in Acts where men were given this itinerant ministry to preach the word, and we've seen it given to various offices within the church. Nevertheless, it was an office within the church itself. But the closest thing we have to that today in actuality is missions. And our mission program is for the purpose of planting churches of Jesus Christ. Missions is not going, as we noted, over to some foreign country and sitting for 30 years and planting a church of 25. The idea is you plant a church, you move on, you plant another church. In time, those churches will grow, they will become indigenous, they will help each other, and that was the way the Apostle Paul himself did missions. I heard someone speak one time concerning missions and said that the Reformers were not really involved in missionary endeavors. Well, that's because he thought missionary endeavors would look among the Reformed like it is today in many of the evangelical churches. Not the case at all. Calvin's idea 
of missions was planting churches. Simple. That's how you do missions. You plant churches. That's what God said he would bless is his church. And so it is that these evangelists spread not only the good news, but the founding of the very churches, and then where the various apostles and the apostles' assistants went out, and like Timothy, and they went and they preached and they organized all of this a part of the very foundation and fabric of the early church by Jesus Christ. It's something we don't think of today. We don't think like that because we have changed, we have altered, we've done it so much different than the way it was done in the early church time period. Well, we're going to turn our attention today to this fourth and fifth office that we find, the office is here mentioned in verse 11. These differ from the first three. The first three are clearly temporary offices within the church. However, when we come to pastor and teacher, these twin offices, they are permanent to the church of Jesus Christ. It's very important for us to note that. It's important to note why they are permanent and how they function and are like unto the temporary offices, but carrying on in a more permanent structure to the church, essential, if you will, to the very foundation of the church itself and its continuation in the ongoing work of planting the church spreading the gospel, building the kingdom of God throughout the earth. Well, if we would, let us turn our attention then to verse 4. Here Paul writes, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. We are continuing to look at this provision that Jesus Christ has given for his church as it was organized under the New Testament administration, under the authority of Christ himself. He who is the groom who marries himself to the bride. It is his church. It is not just a remnant of people who have made a profession of faith. It is a living organism which he organizes. A church that has form, shape, function, and practice, both in the New Testament and continues on to this day. And let me just simply state, no one has a right to change the decree as Christ has given it unto his church, to change its structure or the order of the church itself. We cannot ignore the church. We cannot avoid it. We cannot destroy it. It belongs to Christ. We must function in the very main structure of his church as he has ordained it. That's why there was such an emphasis by the Reformed and Puritan teachers. The ministers understood the very essence and purpose of the church of Jesus Christ as that body organized, given offices and gifts to continue the work of Christ forward. We cannot ignore this church. And it came to the point in which the Reformers and the Puritans made it very clear. To be outside of the visible church is to be out side of Christ, period. That's the importance that they put upon the church. Do not tell me you're a Christian and you're not a member and under the authority of the structure that Christ has given to his church. How dare you say you love Christ and ignore his church and what he has commanded of us in relationship to it? And so when I see someone who simply says, well, 
you know, I'm not in a church, but I'm a believer. My answer is, uh uh-huh, right. You think you're a believer, but by all testimony, you have no profession of the true faith. You can't not ignore Christ and his commands, and you cannot ignore the church that he has commanded us to be a part of. Now, the apostle here is very clear as to how the unity that he's been speaking about, and this is what really we come down to, the very concept of the unity of the church, how that unity was to belong to the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, if you will, the church of Jesus Christ, of which St. Paul has clearly been speaking, how it was to continue in that form and shape and structure as a church, a continuation after Christ's departure and his ascension up unto the heavens to rule and to reign at the right hand of God. It is not something that was temporary, only there were some offices which were. But he left the church officers who were permanent, permanent to work permanent to carry out their duties and responsibilities. We cannot forget the church of Jesus Christ was equipped by him in providing the church with those men who will seek to keep the object of the profession of their faith focused on the person of Jesus Christ, who is all in all to the church. If it wasn't for that emphasis, it very easily could have happened. The early church would have completely apostatized. The one doctrine they never seem to be willing to leave is the doctrine and the importance of Christ as it relates to the church. The church is the extension of Christ's ministry. It was designed for a particular primary purpose. And he says that to us here in these verses uh, 11 through 13 of chapter 4. It is the edification of that body. It is the building up of their faith. It is in doing those things as the church grows in the expansion of the kingdom through the preaching of the gospel and churches planted Those churches are designed to build up God's people in their faith. Therefore, it should be of no surprise that we see Christ furnishing proper officers to the church and then supplying those men who are appropriately qualified for this work of ministry throughout the church's history. Thus it is incumbent upon our Lord to ensure that these men were qualified, that they could fulfill their duty. He had to gift them. It is not giftings that they themselves have. It is giftings that come from the Spirit of God given to men to fulfill a call and a duty for Christ in relationship to his church. It's not that certain men cannot get up and preach, as it were, if I use that word very conditionally here, or teach something they believe in and be passionate about it. You don't believe me? Listen to Adolf Hitler give his speeches. Man, you thought he was a raving fundamentalist. It's not the ability to preach. It's not the ability in the sense of using words, expressing things from a pulpit, putting things together in structural form. Those are all good and important. But the gift is what actually is the result of that ability being used that is in man in that it edifies The Spirit of God lays an anointing upon that which is said, and it benefits, it edifies, it builds up 
the body of Jesus Christ. Too often, we listen to people and we go, oh, he's a really good preacher. But that's not the question. There are many good speakers, many good teachers. The question is, do they edify the body of Christ? Do they say something? Something more than giving four points in a poem and making an emotional appeal to you. Motherhood, apple pie in America, and make you cry. That does not make a message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It does not have an edifying point to build up the body of Christ according to the teaching of the word of God. We must understand that. The question is, are our people growing in the grace of God? Are they benefiting in the understanding of the truth and the knowledge that is revealed in that preaching, that it benefits them, that they themselves live lives of sanctified saints, growing in their knowledge, growing in the grace that God has given to them through that word, through that gift of the ministry that he has laid upon others, that they progress in their sanctification and they continue to work toward the very end of bringing all things in their sphere of duty to its proper end, to the glory and honor of God. Do they apply it in their community? Do they apply it in their home? Do they apply it in their personal lives? Please note also, if you would, the use of the word some. And he gave some to be, and some to be, and some to be. Which should alter us in that we should recognize not everyone. Not everyone was granted these gifts. And when you don't have these gifts, not the gifts of getting up and speaking or teaching, but the gifts of edification that has the anointing of God's word upon you. You know, it reminds me of something that I remember William Tennant Sr. wrote in his book on the Law College. He once said, we were waiting, George Whitfield was supposed to have been at the Law College to preach to the young men. People had gathered from the church there as well, and he didn't show up on time. And so his son Gilbert was preaching. He said he had been preaching almost 45 minutes at least, and he said when Reverend Whitfield rode up on his horse, and he said he got off, we told him we were waiting for him. He was welcome to get into the pulpit immediately. He said he walked up. He got into the pulpit. He began to preach. And he said, I sat there and I thought, well, where's the good stuff? I mean, we're having revival across the country. Where's the good stuff? He's preaching everything we already know. And he said at that moment, just like that, God reached down through his spirit and broke our hearts. And it was at that moment I realized it's not the messenger. It's the anointing on the message that he brings. Men who are gifted build you up. They teach you the truth of God's word. They increase your knowledge of truth. They increase your desire to be faithful to the things that God has called you to as a believer. In our context here, to walk worthy of our calling. These are God's gift to men he has chosen throughout history. To equip the believers in their Christian walk. Thus, in the context, that phrase, walking worthy, as I just mentioned, requires that those who are called and gifted by Christ 
to perfect his church must not only be about the business, but must be assured that those who hear him are growing in God's grace and truth. For if he is not feeding them the word of God, if he is not helping them to grow in their understanding, he is not benefiting them, then he doesn't have the gift that's necessary to preach, or for that matter, to teach. Well, let us turn our attention, if we could then, to this next set of offices of pastors and teachers. The office or orders of ministers that were given permanently within the, with the other officers of the church, who of course were temporal, as we have noted, by Christ, pastors and teachers, was one of those additional benefits resulting as a result of his ascension. Christ is ascending into the Father to rule and reign over all things in heaven and earth. But he has not left his church without a testimony, the Spirit who comes and he gives the final touches of the revelation of God that we have in Scripture that is necessary, but he gives to his church men gifted and a Spirit who leads them and the people that they ought to be of one mind and of one spirit, and not many. It's not only the offices. The men who fulfill that office were given divine authority, given those necessary gifts, which is, by the way, under the work and the operation of the Holy Spirit, that they are portioned out, read 1 Corinthians, Chapter 10. But it's the very reason the reformers of the Puritans said when the minister gets up, when we are in the worship service, when he preaches the truth of the word of God, we should see it as if God himself is delivering the message. Not me, but the message is from God. God himself could stand here and be speaking that word. Of course, he can't stand here because he's a spirit. That's unessential to him. But you get what I mean. These are not just words. This is not just a literary study of a book. These are the very words of God. To man. These are the words of life. How can they not affect you? They must. But that's the duty and the responsibility. That's why we don't let people into office lightly who say they all called of God to preach or teach. Our answer is you must then be prepared to do so. We're not like the Moravians who stood around and when it comes time for service, we just put our Bible down and let it drop open and say, well, that's where God wants me to preach. No, no. We want you to study what you're going to preach on. We want to be ensured that you are getting every aspect of what's trying to be revealed to us. Yes, we can't exhaust the knowledge of it, but you must work toward exalting and preaching and trying to exhaust the very depth of the truth of the word of God. Why? It is that truth in its purity where we are edified and built up. You show me an uneducated man, I'll show you a man who'll preach John 3, 16, 52 times a year. Well, except for Christmas and Easter. And at Easter, he's got to get his bunny, rabbits, and eggs in place for the church. And for Christmas, his tree so everybody can worship in the church. I'm telling you people, that kind of preaching and ministering does not edify. It does nothing to move the body of Christ. But you know what? The amazing thing is the people who come home 
I rarely today ever hear someone say, wow, the preaching was really good at church. You know what most of those people say? Boy, did we have a good musical program today. That's what you're going to hear on the internet more than anything else. Our church had this type of service. We had these people in to sing. Oh, it was glorious. How is it they don't see the preaching of the word as superior to that? It is beyond me. In our text, we are told that he gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets. Remember, these were men who functioned primarily as inspired foretellers, but not foretellers. And some to be these evangelists, who were essentially those itinerant missionary leaders. Evangelists to the church to spread the gospel of the kingdom. But to the church he gave these pastors who are to be shepherds. From the very Greek word polymen, which is one who oversees, cares for, excuse me, not polymen, there's no L, it's poimen. Who cares for the body of Christ as a shepherd would care for his sheep has this nurturing responsibility, this responsibility to protect them, protect them from that which is out and things that come from within, to ensure they are not led off in a different path, a different direction, in the direction that Christ wants his church to walk in, to have the mind of Christ, to be in the spirit of Christ, to think the way Christ thinks. <coughs> Thus he has this duty and responsibility to care for the church. But he also gave some to be teachers. Comes from a Greek term meaning doctor or master, or we translate it as well as teacher. That is one who is equipped to train, to teach the church. And clearly, it's looking to the church not at large, but the church in particular, congregations. Interestingly, in the history of the church, John Christostom and St. Augustine were of the opinion that St. Paul was speaking indiscriminately here of pastors and teachers as belonging to one of the same class that the name teacher does to some extent apply to all pastors. But by that he means of one class, these are the ministers of God. Their job is to minister to you the word, whether it is in the preaching of the gospel seeking to reach out and bring others to Christ, to their gospel that they preach, or through the teaching itself in the building up of the body. As a side note to that, what these two saints were pointing out is this, the preaching and the teaching in the church were of the same order as the temporal offices themselves. But as permanent officers, their ministry continues as those who do preach, who shepherd in the church, and instruct in the faith that has been delivered to the church, that which we call the doctrinal purity of the church. It belongs to their order. <clears throat> Excuse me. It belongs to their ministry. It is a part of their calling. <coughs> Excuse me. No one else is called to teach who has not been qualified for these two offices. That's why we take such precaution. <coughs> Excuse me. Both within the church to recognize their gifts of edification <coughs> and also by the presbytery to ensure that they are properly qualified 
to handle the work that they are being set aside for. <coughs> Excuse me. Yet this idea does not appear to be a sufficient reason why there ought to be two offices per se, which tend to differ from each other. This is an ongoing conflict of ideas. Some have said it is clearly an office that really means only pastor-teacher. Some say it is both pastor and teacher. Teaching is no doubt the duty of all pastors. But to maintain sound doctrine requires a talent for interpreting the scriptures very clearly and in depth. And a man may be a teacher who is not necessarily qualified to be a preacher or a shepherd of the flock of Jesus Christ. This term really provokes the idea of a scholar, of an educator, of a master of theology and the doctrines that are to be established and taught within the body of Christ. Pastors are normally those who have the charge of a particular flock, who preach the word of God and they teach them. Yes, they do. And we do call them, by the way, pastor teachers. Because you cannot preach without teaching something. But sometimes there are not other men who are as gifted as the pastor, and he has the work of doing both. We should have no objection to their receiving of the name teacher as well, if they are pastors if it be understood that there is a distinct class of teachers who preside both in the training and the education of the church and of pastors and in the instruction that is necessary to edify the body, to establish them in the doctrine of the church of Jesus Christ. Sometimes it may be the same person who is serving both as a pastor and a teacher, but the duties to be performed are entirely different in such cases, historically, we still recognize that when one person has got the duty and responsibility, he becomes the pastor and the teacher of the church. He holds the two offices and their duty and responsibility. That's why, <clears throat> if you read your confession very carefully, doctors of the church may be within the church and the presbytery, but not necessarily in their particular church on the congregational session, the session of the church itself. They might be invited to be there. They almost certainly are qualified in the absence of the pastor to take over and to preach or teach, as it were, from the pulpit, to instruct and to build up, to serve the Lord's Supper, unquest unquestionable. But he may not do that as a regular business. His regular business may be that of one who trains in a seminary or in a university. Or perhaps his job within the church is, you are here to be our scholar in residence, to teach classes, to build our people up. That does not mean he has a responsibility to rule, to shepherd, and to work with the people personally in their life. Thus, the consideration of this has been given much attention, and it must continually be carefully examined and re-examined often. Apostles, evangelists, prophets were bestowed on the church only for a limited time, but these pastors and teachers, without them, there is no government, and there is no church properly structured. You cannot do without these offices being fulfilled. That's why there was such a strong emphasis in Scotland during the Reformation. The amazing thing was there was few men who converted to the Reformed faith. And uh, literally a Reformation from the top down. But you had all these people, churches, and no pastors. Go back and read some of the history. Some of those men were preaching in three and four churches on a Sunday. 
You must have officers. Read our book of church order. If you are without a pastor, that has to be resolved. And that's not something you do, you do just in over the next five years. It needs to be done in order to ensure the preaching and the instruction is there in the body of Christ. That's how much we believe in the offices that Christ has given to his church. They are essential. Essential. Essential to the calling of Christ to his church. Essential to the building up of the church in Jesus Christ in his doctrine. It's Christ's prerogative. He appointed the officers, and he ordains and gifts the men to fulfill them. We must consider just how rich is the church of Jesus Christ, that it had at first such a variety of officers and has still such a variety of gifts given to it today, but in particular concerning these two offices that are fundamentally part of its essence and foundation. How kind Christ was to his church. And what are they going to do? They're going to build him up for what purpose? What is the ultimate goal here? Clearly the glory of God. Told that to us in Ephesians chapter 1. But what is he bringing out and teaching? These men have been gifted by Christ through the Spirit to edify the body, to what end? Unity. That's the end. Unity. He gives to the church men who exercise the offices to bring unity. The hardest thing a church has to do is maintain its unity. I know of nothing harder to deal with. Of the pastor, the scriptures simply teach, for example, Paul writing in 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through 13, and we urge you, brethren, writing to the Thessalonians, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourself. I know of nothing harder to achieve than having peace within the church of Jesus Christ. But that's the duty of building up. That's what we do as ministers and teachers in the church of Jesus Christ. Listen to Hebrews 13, 17. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive. We don't have people who live that way, even in Reformed churches today, hardly. I'm not going to submit. I don't like what they're doing. I'm leaving. Boop, down the road to go to the next little church. Boop, down the road they go to the next little church. And we call them church jumpers. And they just go to the next. I'm going to find a church that pleases me. I can't find anything more in direct contradiction to what he says here in Romans 13, 17. Oh, if they're teaching heresy, damnable heresy within the church, and the church itself as a denomination isn't dealing with it, you got a problem, you're going to have to work it and fix it. If you can't, you will have to leave. But there's no place to just hop and go on. Listen to what he says. Be submissive. Why? Why should they be submissive? For they watch out for your souls. They're preaching and teaching in order to ensure that you end up where you're supposed to end up. You know, back in 1975, when I first began pastoring, 
at 19 years old, I guess it was 74, the fall of 74, began to pastor my first church. I'll never forget the first report that came out. Out of all the evangelical churches, perhaps on a Sunday morning, only 20 to 30% were probably saved people. Out of all those people, the majority would say they are believers. But the reality, they said, was probably when you got to the evening services and it was down from, let's say, if you had 300 to, to 90, that would be the core of what is at least carrying the church. But if you want to see the real believers, apart from those who have to work and can't be there, go to a Wednesday evening service and see who shows up. Those unequivocally are most likely the people in the church that are saved. That was their finding. What is the job that we have to care for your soul, to ensure that you get the pure gospel of the word of Jesus Christ given to you? And he says, as those who must give an account, we have a greater accountability for the job that we've been called to. He says, therefore, let them do so with joy and not with grief. For that would be unprofitable for you. Why? Because now they're no longer looking out for your soul. They're having to look out for you, period. Least they see you coming. And they go, oh no, here he comes again. Acts 20, 28. Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you an overseer. Where is the appointment come from? The Holy Spirit. Christ has given officers and offices in the church, and the Holy Spirit is fulfilling in time and space progressively those who are called to fulfill those functions, to shepherd the church of God, to oversee it, to shepherd it, to protect it, to teach it, to feed it, to ensure that nothing unwholesome comes within the body to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. He bought them. They're his. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 1. Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ, given, excuse me, got two pages here. <clears throat> Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ, to the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and the deacons. Clearly, there's two functions here being set forth in the idea those who are shepherds, overseers, bishops, those who are responsible for the church and the deacons who are responsible not only for the physical welfare of the church, but also for its spiritual welfare as well. 1 Timothy 3.1, this is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, an overseer, he desires a good work. It is a good office to be desired of, but it's not one you can simply say, my desire is evidence of my calling. That's not true. Desiring the office is one thing, being called and gifted to it, is a whole different matter. Titus 1, 5 through 7. For this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set and order the things that are lacking <clears throat> and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. This is Paul writing to Titus. I left you in Crete. I left you there to do the work of getting the church organized. That's how important it was for them, because they believed the church of Jesus Christ was an organized church. And appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. If a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, faithful children, 
not accused of dissipation or insubordination. For a bishop must be blameless, a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money. 1 Peter 5, 1 through 2. The elders who are among you, I exhort. I who am. Here Peter says, a fellow elder. Notice he has taken the name of apostle off. And he now refers to himself as being an elder. I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, which goes back to the fact that's why he was an apostle appointed by Christ. And also partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, shepherds. Not by compulsion, not because somebody has put you into this position and tried to force you to do it. But do it, he says, willingly. Not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. In other words, do it with joy. As for the teachers, those are those who work in teaching the doctrine of the church, as we've been saying. They're teaching the doctrines of Christianity. They refute the contrary errors that have been made about the Scripture. They deny false truth claims. They show them to be what they are, nothing but false doctrines. They are not unskilled. They are skilled individuals within the church. St. Paul twice refers to himself as a teacher as well as being a pastor. 2 Timothy 1.11 To which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. And in 1 Timothy 2.7 for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am speaking the truth in Christ and not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Clearly you have these offices established, their purpose clearly, directly given through the revelation of Scripture. Pastors clearly preach, shepherd, and teach the Word. But we are never told that a teacher in and of himself, a doctor within a church, is necessarily gifted to be the one who preaches or to shepherd the church. Not that it cannot be, but that is not always the case. The problem we have is we have not listened to Dr. Calvin in these things, and I think he had the right understanding. The doctors of the church were to do that very thing. They were qualified, educated men. Their job was to strike down any errant and heretical doctrine within the church, whether it come from without or from within, their job was to go and to hear the word preached to be sure that what was preached was the word of the living God. It was in conjunction with the evangelical doctrine of orthodox Christianity. And at any point someone altered or changed that, they were to jump on that immediately. Their job was to ensure purity of teaching concerning the Word of God. And their job was to ensure anybody who tried to bring into the church from outside a false theology, they would address it and kill it immediately. Well, that didn't last long in Presbyterianism. It got altered. And doctors were only then seminary professors or educators, period. But that really wasn't their job. Their job was to be protectors of the Word. Some could be pastors. Some may just be the doctors of the church. It's very important to understand what I want you to see. God gave these two offices, and I'm not going into all of the duties. We could go through First, Second Timothy, and Titus sometime and discuss all of the different things about these offices. These offices were given as permanent means to expand the kingdom and build the church up that it might be able to be a testimony, a living testimony of an organism that is of the one mind in Christ, of the unity of the body of Christ, not divided, united in him. Oh, there can be diversity, but the diversity is trumped by the unity. we are in Christ, and if we are a church of Jesus Christ, and if we certainly have 
properly been structured as that church and recognized with the authority of the church itself to be and to function as his body. We need to be always seeking the unity, not division, not schism, unity. Well, let me simply say in conclusion, in the New Testament, the elders exercised the function of the shepherd. They also required that they should be able to teach as well. We've seen that, Timothy chapter 3, 2. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, be of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach. This is not ruling elders, our church governors as we call them. We do, under the auspice of the presbytery, through these bishops, these overseers, these ministers, we do allow elders to do certain functions if they have trained at a certain level in the absence of the pastor. Under his authority, we allow them to teach. But my friends, it's a limited structure, and it has to be. Why? We don't have the authority to expand it any further than what Christ himself expanded it. So we have to be very careful with it. Very important. <clears throat> However, a teacher who is called to teach also must be about the work of teaching. We need to learn not to force men to function in offices that they have not qualified for. Romans 12, 7 says, Our ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in his teaching or in teaching. What is most important to note is this is a gift. And the gift is to have unity through preaching and teaching. In 1 Corinthians 12, and I'm not going to repeat it, but here again you have this statement about the apostles, the prophets. You have those who are teachers, workers of Miracles, healers, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. By the way, the word administration there is what Calvin uses for the word church governors, which commonly became called in Europe ruling elders. But he's seen them only as government administrators. Teaching enables believers to understand and to grow spiritually in their Christian walk. Thus again, the very idea walking worthy here. Acts 20, 32. So now, brethren, I commend to you, <clears throat> commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. That's the end of these gifts. That's the purpose of them. Are you being built up? Are you learning? Are you growing in the truth? And is God affecting that as grace in your life? Are you learning to be patient? Are you learning to exercise the gifts of the Spirit that have been given to you as a believer? Ephesians 4, 15 through 16, later here Paul says, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into all things in him who is the head, Christ from whom the whole body joined, joined and knitted together by whatever joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. That's the goal. Ephesians six seventeen, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It is the Word of God that builds up. That is our sword. That is where we can discern the truths of doctrines. Second Timothy 2.15, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, who can rightly divide the Word of truth. He's talking to Timothy. He's talking to one who is to minister the Word of God. 2 Timothy 4, 2, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. 
1 Thessalonians 1, 5 through 6, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit in much assurance, as you know what kind of men were among you for your sake. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit. That's what these offices have been given for in the church of Jesus Christ. They're given by Christ to build up his church. They're given by Christ to edify, to bring the body to unity. Let us be of that one mind of Christ. Let us have the mind of Christ. You don't get that unless you have people who are leading and teaching you, who have been gifted by the Holy Spirit himself so that they are directing your understanding and bringing you to the point of unity in spite of diversity that can exist, in spite of differences of opinion. Never mind the differences. They are not allowed to divide us. You don't divide the body of Christ, period. We unite. That's our calling. The people ought to desire what the Word of God declares unto them, and those who declare the Word of God ought to ensure that the people desire to have that unity and oneness of Christ that is the greatest testimony we have before a watching world. We are of Christ. We are of Christ. We are one body. Yeah, we may have differences of opinion about things, but you know what? We are one body. We are of Christ. Our unity in Christ trumps all of our diversity. That's what Paul wants us to understand. That's how you walk worthy. Your walking worthy becomes a living testimony before the world. It is a testimony unto Christ who has saved you, a testimony of the Spirit living in you, a testimony of what you've been taught. That's why he gifts the church with these offices to make sure this very thing is carried out to his glory and to his honor. Because where there is unity in Christ, there we are strengthened and cannot be divided, and will not be divided. No matter what comes, our unity is in Christ. It's all about Him. That's all that Paul's saying. You need to walk worthy in a way that says, it's all about Christ. It's not about me, it's not about you. It's about Christ. You didn't save yourself. I didn't save you. I didn't save myself. It's Christ who's done this work. It's all about Christ. Everything that Christ has appointed has one purpose. It's all about Christ. Because when it's all about Christ, it glorifies the Father. And that ultimately is our purpose. And everything that he has called us to do to glorify God in all things, especially in the church of his son, Jesus Christ. Let us seek to live that way. Let us remember as Christ resurrected, as we come every Sunday as those who are also resurrected from death to life. We're resurrected in one, not many, but in one person, Jesus Christ. We cannot and we will not let that testimony go in any other way. May God help us to be love, loving, patient, kind, gentle toward one another. As far as it is possible for us, as Paul said, be at peace with all men, which includes men within the house of Jesus Christ. That's the testimony of Christ before the world. That's the very thing that all of the other false religions of the world cannot do. 
but we can in Christ. Because the power we have is not the might of men, but it is the power of the Spirit. It is the preaching and the teaching of the Word. We win without even having to fire a shot. It is ours. It has already been declared ours. The question is, is when are we going to claim what is ours that rightfully belongs to him? That's the failing of the church. God help us to dwell on the importance of unity. As you come now to the table of our Lord Jesus Christ, as Pastor Rick no doubt will tell you, when we come to eat, why do we eat together? Why do we drink together? We are one in Christ. Let us remember why we're here and for whom we're here. Shall we pray?